Welcome, everybody. We are um, lucky to have today Mike Graham from the ADA, who heads up the education slash lobbying operation in Washington. I use the word education because as we got started, he made it very clear that lobbying is not what we do at the ADA in Washington. We spend a lot of time doing education. And so um, congratulations, Mike, on being one of the 32 most influential people in dentistry. Uh, we've run this list now for four consecutive years. No surprise, you have been on the list every one of the four years and probably will be going into the future. So um, thank you for being influential and thank you for being here with us today. Thanks, Chuck. Appreciate Any, it. Love being anytime. here. Thank you. Um, so Mike, I thought where we'd start is tell us a little bit about your journey, um, how you got where you are, and uh, a little bit about where you kind of see yourself in the future. Well, I, I actually got started in politics when I was in college. Um, uh, it, it was not my not my major, but um, one of my parents' best friends was over the house for dinner, and he was actually the county executive of Montgomery County, Maryland, um, which actually at that time had a budget larger than four or five states. And and um, and we got into this discussion, and he said, "Well, kids today, you know, this is 1970." 1976, I think. He said, well, kids today don't, uh, they don't care about what's going on in politics. And I said, no, I think you're wrong. We follow it. And, and he said, all right, well, come and work for me this summer. I'll give you a paid internship. And they paid $5 an hour, um, which beat the $3 an hour I was making working construction in the summertime. So it was air conditioning. I loved it. Um, and I got the bug. And uh, from there, I worked for a U.S. senator, a congressman, a state rep, two governors, um, and then eventually went into private practice. And in 1995, started with the American Dental Association. So now I'm in my 25th year and uh, representing the greatest profession on earth. So, wow. so you started uh, in, uh, in politics itself first and then moved over to uh, the lobbying, uh, influencing right. area, right? Which, oh. which actually a lot of lobbyists do, quite frankly, they, they, they get their tr training, if you will, they learn how they learn the players, they learn the policy, they learn the process, they learn the politics. And if you're a good lobbyist, you learn to be persuasive and perseverant. All those P's I tell my staff all the time, you got to know all the P's. So it usually begins in an office and then you slide over into representing whatever profession, you know, is your passion. Talk a little bit about uh, the influence side of it, right? Because that's the theme of the day is influence. Um, as a person who was on the side uh, to try to get influenced, right, and be, get educated, and now you've moved over to the side of doing the education and the influencing, how do those two roles differ? And uh, what are the keys to success in what you do now? Yeah. Well, uh, they differ substantially. In fact, many people who who work on Capitol Hill and then go into the private sector realize, oh, I don't I don't like being the person who chases after people. I, I want people to come to me. And then they go right back up to the hill um, or in in some political position. Um, but, you know, I for me, having been involved at all three levels of government, um, I. I found I, I found over time what my political philosophy was, and it aligns so much with the dentist, which is I I, I do believe um, in smaller government, and I believe that uh, you should allow uh, businesses with some guidelines to 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 operate on their own. You have to trust the system, and you know the reason why we've been so successful, Chuck. It, in my opinion, is because of the reputation of dentists and dentistry. You know, year in and year out, dentists are named, uh, you know, in the top five uh, most um, uh, well thought of, uh, respected professions. And boy, I'll tell you, that's something that they've earned. And and that is something that I tell my, my team and myself all the time. 
we have to protect the reputation of the profession. Everything we do is under a microscope. Um, they're going to look at us and they're going to make judgments about the profession by how we represent. And, and so, uh, you know, any success that I've achieved, it's, uh, and my staff is because uh, I think in large part, the great reputation that dentists and the profession have earned uh, over the many years. Wow. So you packed a lot in there. I want to unpack it a little bit. One of the things that came through loud and clear is your influence from what you just said, your influence really is really comes from the dentists and the dental profession being so respected and influential itself. Talk a little bit about that and what it's like to represent 100,000 plus very respected professionals. How, how does that in, how does that allow you to be an influencer? Well, if, if you ever read one of our letters that goes up to Capitol Hill, it always starts out with, on behalf of the 163,000 members of the American Dental Association, and I, I think that may have ticked up a little bit, which is great, um, we want to be able to show that that we've got a, a, a significant percentage of dentists belonging to our organization, which is extremely impressive. And I've got some great stories I could tell about that, but, but I won't go into it right now. But, um, you know, when you represent almost two thirds of all dentists in the country, that's impactful. And, and members of Congress know that. Mm-hmm. And, and they go, OK, so you're not representing a percentage of dentists. You represent the majority of dentists, if not close to the vast majority of dentists. So you, you really do represent what dentists around the country think and feel. Um, and, and that really is um, that along with the great reputation that dentists have, gives us tremendous influence. And the great thing is probably um, of the 535 members of Congress, House and Senate, I'm hopeful every one of them goes to the dentist every year. I'm pretty sure they do. So they get to see firsthand the value that they receive personally. And and then they hear that from their constituents. Um, And when they don't perceive value, they're happy to tell us because they themselves are consumers. So I think it's a closeness of the profession, the, the, the great respect, and the fact that we represent such a large percentage of dentists that gives us an edge over just about everybody else on Capitol Hill. And I, I, I say this, and those who have heard me speak, I, I, I rarely leave this out. Um, Chuck, I, I asked them, how, what, what number of lobbyists uh, lobby every single day on, on Capitol Hill? Give me, give me the number. What number do you think lobby every single day on Capitol Hill, either in person or virtually? Uh, 3,000. 76,000 lobbyists wow. lobby every single day on Capitol Hill. So, so how do we get our voice heard through all that clutter? I mean, the, the, being a member of Congress and the uh, House members represent about 800,000 constituents and senators, of course, it ranges from California to Delaware or Wyoming or Alaska, which have a small percentage of that. So how is it we can get our voice heard? And it's all those things combined. So it's, it's, it is the reputation. It is the fact that we speak on behalf of the majority, if not the vast majority. Um, these are the things that make a difference. And in addition to that, we've, you know, we do a, we have one of the uh, best grassroots campaigns in Washington for an organization our size. Uh, we do a fantastic lobby day where we bring in about 1,100 dentists and dental students um, every year. And in fact, this very week, we're doing virtual lobbying. So, which, which means we're having our members of Congress call in, Zoom in with their member of Congress and or staff. Um, and we have a, uh, a very, uh, Good size uh, political action committee, ADPAC, um, which it probably ranks, um, I, I believe, still in the top 50 largest PACs, and there are over 10,000 PACs. So all of this gives us an opportunity to have our voice heard, and that gives us the edge. So one of the things you mentioned before, and I've heard it before, is a higher percentage of dentists are members of the ADA than generally other healthcare professions. Can oh, you talk about yeah. that for a minute and really how that gives you more influence on in Washington and dentists in general? So uh, not, to, not to throw uh, our medical colleagues under the bus, but the AMA has seen, um, they've seen their membership over the years drop down and it has ticked up 
to their credit, but it's hovers somewhere around 25%. I think members of Congress know that, and they know that the AMA, very well-respected organization, but you only represent 25% of all physicians. And so when when we're speaking uh, on behalf of dentistry, I think members of Congress know, well, they really are speaking on behalf of the the, uh, majority, if not vast majority of our members. And it makes a a big difference because that means that that replicates in the states and, and in those congressional districts. So it, it, um, you know, they, they know, okay. Oh, okay. They're speaking on behalf of my dentists who live back in my County or County. So it makes Interesting. a big difference. Yeah. So the last few months have been fascinating for all of us uh, yeah. with the COVID-19 and all the changes that have come. You guys and your team have been hugely active on Capitol Hill, trying to get the world to work better for dentists. Can you talk a little bit about what that's been like and maybe what your biggest success was? Because I think you've had a lot of them from my perspective. So what's it been like the last couple of months? How have things changed from your perspective? And then what was the biggest success that uh, you've seen so far? Uh, Well, thank you. We have been amazingly successful, but again, in my way of thinking, all the things we have done leading up to mid-March um, impacted our ability to tell our story to members of Congress and staff once the shutdown occurred um, so that all the relationships and the trust that we built between members and their staff um, really were necessary at the very moment that everything shut down. And here's why. I could no longer go in and and my staff uh, sit across the table from uh, a member of Congress or or a staff member to that member of Congress and say, you know, this is our issue and this is what we this is what um, we would like done. Um, it, we then had to do it by phone and by email and sometimes text message. And we actually have those numbers because we we built up this great relationship that that we have the information from those uh, members of Congress and staff that we're able to make our case. Um, and, and there's, again, there's that great trust between the profession and I think members of Congress. So when the first package came up, we were able to make the case about what the dentists need to stay afloat. Um, that That so many of our dentists because we didn't exactly know what was going on with this whole COVID situation, um, they shut down their practices except for emergency cases, right? Because where are those, if those, if the dentists aren't treating the emergency cases, and by the way, the dentist puts him or herself at risk by treating those patients, right? Um, but, but they treated them anyway, so they wouldn't end up in the ER room, so they wouldn't clog the ER rooms where the COVID patients were going. And so, um, and so many dentists across the country were taking their extra PPE, if you will, and donating it to the hospital. So that was on their own dime. And, and I'm, I'm sure your company was involved in, in that project as well. So um, that built goodwill. And when, because we have those good relations, because we have that trust, um, when we said, this is what we need, when we need the idle grants, the idle loans, the PPP loans, for example, and they were really in, in uh, parts of the first and second package that the members of Congress said, you're right, and, and we'll make sure you get it. And so uh, we were able to package that in the right way. Now, um, I will tell you, one of the most uh, influential things that occurred in early on, and I mean the first uh, four packages, uh, which occurred really in the first three months, was that when we reached out to our dentists and we said, we need you to contact your member of Congress and let them know to support these provisions in the bill, um, we got tens of thousands of dentists to respond. So it, so far to date, Chuck, we have had 150,000 dentists emailing their member of Congress, producing um, 600,000 emails. Now, in one of those, we got, I think it was 286 emails, 286,000 emails went to Capitol Hill on, I believe it was the second uh, COVID package. And 
that is phenomenal. That's amazing. Phenomenal. Uh, it's phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, members of Congress w- were calling me <laughs> saying, we got it. We understand what you need. Thank you. <laughs> and I'd say, that's hey. amazing. It and, is amazing. And they responded. And so um, one of the things you mentioned that others have mentioned before in these prior uh, in these prior podcasts is the relationship between trust and influence. Right. So I think one of the things everybody says, and I think it's right, is without trust, there can be no influence. And I think that's been your experience. Right. I, I always think that the first you know, 10 to 30 seconds in any conversation you're having with a member of Congress, you know, Trust is determined right there in those few seconds. Um, And when you have a profession like we represent that is doing so much good out there, I mean, there's um, I I had seen some number close to three billion dollars worth of free or discounted dental care is provided to Americans every year. Um, And and members of Congress know this and they know about the Give Kids a Smile and they know about mom's programs and that builds that trust and that and all the veterans programs that dentists are involved in all of these things, it builds that trust. So when we walk into the room, if they didn't trust us, the conversation is going to be they're not listening after the after the first 10 seconds. So we have that with our members of Congress. And that, again, that makes all the difference, I think. Interesting. So one of the things we were talking about a little bit before we got on was that there are five dentists who are members of Congress. Talk a little bit about how that happened. That certainly must increase the amount of influence that you and dentistry have. Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for um, giving them the recognition they deserve. Um, You know, when I started in this position 10 years ago, we had one dentist member of Congress. And it was um, one of my goals and uh, and the goals of our staff in Washington to help get more dentists elected to Congress, because there are places we cannot be um, in Congress in the middle of the night when they're in closed session and they're talking about this bill. Um, If there's a dentist in the room, what do you think happens? You know, if there's a dentist, a member of Congress in the room, they're going to turn to that dentist. They're going to say, you know, hey, Dr. Simpson, Mike Simpson, you know, does this how how do dentists treat this kind of situation or does this impact dentistry this way? And to have someone like Mike and Paul Gosar and Jeff Van Drew and and uh, Brian Babin and and Drew Ferguson in there to say, yes, this is how it impacts it. They're not lobbying for us. They're representing their profession. And they every single one of those gentlemen believes very strongly. They're proud to be dentists. And, and you'll see them wearing the tooth pin, um, which is a pin that we started in ADPAC that, you know, dentistry, it doesn't represent Republicans. It doesn't represent Democrats. We say it represents the tooth party. And so we were where, in fact, I'm embarrassed that I didn't put mine on. Um, <laughs> I'll reach into my bag and grab it. You but it. we have it's a it's a it's a tooth with, you know, with the stars and stripes on it. And and uh, you walk into a member of Congress's office and I will tell you one out of two times they'll say, oh, that's neat. Can, where can I get one of those? Wow. And we give it to them. But they're very proud to be dentists. And and uh, and and um, while I know they represent all their constituents, they they let them know they're proud to be dentists. Wow. That's exciting. Um, so as we emerge from the COVID-19 challenges, what do you think are the next two or three big uh, issues that uh the folks in Capitol Hill are going to deal with as far as dentistry is concerned and where are you guys focused? We're talking about testing and, 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 uh, vaccination and, and, uh, how are the dentists going to play a role in that? Um, so those are some things that are still up there. And, and also, you know, there are some dental practices that are not operating, um, at pre COVID level. So, how are they going to fare getting through that? So we still have those issues, uh, Chuck, that we need to work through because every dental practice um, is something that we're trying to think of. How can we help them? I, if I'm not mistaken from, uh, and you probably uh, have or will interview uh, Marco Vujicic, um, who's yep. our chief economist, uh, brilliant guy um, who's been 
so fantastic to the ADA team and his, and his team over at HPI in providing these numbers. But we've got 99% of dentists back to work, which is amazing. And, and the others that aren't, I think that's their choice, but I'm amazed at the number that have come back to work. And a lot of people were projecting that many dentists would retire, but they didn't. It just goes to show you, these dentists are they are absolutely dedicated to the profession and their patients. And, and boy, it's, um, it's phenomenal that, uh, that they have that dedication. I love representing them for that reason. So, but we have a lot of issues moving forward. I think we're going to have some economic issues. Um, there are some folks that are predicting that the economy uh, might take a second hit um, as uh, things start to level out. Um, you know, we're doing a lot of stuff uh, on uh, third party payer issues, trying to work with the uh, dental insurance companies, dental plans to to come to some agreement on, on uh, how dental practices um, can navigate um, all the uh, requirements. Um, and dental insurance has provided great opportunities for consumers and dentists, but at the same time, it's provided some challenges and we're trying to work through those challenges as well. Um, so uh, there's the third party payer issues. We've been doing a lot with uh, a campaign that we started about um, eight years ago called Action for Dental Health. And it is a program that um, has uh, eight different initiatives uh, that really seeks to improve access to care for those Americans for whatever reason, whether it's money, um, whether it's they're afraid to go to the dentist, um, whether there's not a dentist in the area, uh, those access issues, this campaign seeks to uh, help overcome some of those. And I'm very proud of our community dental health coordinator program. That's where we have an individual in the field who reaches out to patients to educate them on the importance of oral health and help navigate them to a dental office where they can get the care they need and find ways to, to pay for that care. Um, we are trying to stop people from going to emergency departments and hospitals and instead, again, navigate them to, to dental offices. So it's very costly when someone walks into uh, an emergency department um, and it doesn't solve the problem usually. And so we're trying to get the right care to them at the right time. So all these different programs that we've begun um, I think are are taking hold in communities all across the country, and and those are just two of the things that we're focused on. Cool. Um, yeah. So getting back to a, a little bit of a fifty thousand foot view, absent the COVID deal, how do you figure out what are the issues that you should be educating or lobbying on on co in Congress? Do they come from the grassroots of the ADA membership? Do they come from the House of Delegates? Do they come from Kathy and the administrative side, how do you sort of figure out where to focus? I'd imagine there must be hundreds of things that you can talk about mm -hmm. on Capitol Hill, but you got to get focused on the most important ones. Right. Great question. Um, at any one time, I think we're lobbying about 40 to 50 issues, quite frankly, mm -hmm. um, to, to varying degrees of uh, importance and intensity. Uh, now, how do we decide? Well, we are a membership driven organization period. The dentists are in charge. We have councils that provide uh, leadership and guidance on the issues. Uh, they help prioritize those issues. So every year, um, I have two councils that uh, that I work with directly in government affairs, and, and they prioritize the issues that that particular council thinks are important. Okay. Um, we have ADA policy. We don't do really anything on Capitol Hill unless we have policy. If I don't have policy on an issue, I go back to leadership. Um, I go back to the ADA board and say, this is an important issue, I think. And if you think it's important too, we need policy on it. And when you say and policy, can, what does that mean? It means okay. that there's a statement that says this is our position? Exactly. Yes. Great question. Exactly. I'll give you a, a, an example. Please. So <clears throat> two years ago, um, there was not a conversation uh, that I had with a member of Congress that did not include some discussion about opioid abuse. And, and um, two years in, in ago in the spring, um, this issue had grown in such intensity that 
that I felt if we did, and we had no policy at the ADA on opioid abuse. And there were some folks that were claiming some of that opioid abuse actually started in the dental office. In other words, the dentist prescribed an opioid to the patient, the patient got hooked and oh, it's the dentist that caused it. No. So, um, so we went to the board of trustees and Dr. Joe Crowley uh, at the time was president of the ADA and, and he brought the issue to the board in a phone call. And in one night, um, they passed a, uh, a resolution, um, an interim board policy on opioids. Um, within two weeks, we had uh, 1,200 at that time, I believe it was, right. um, dentists and dental students flying into Washington to lobby. And the first thing they talked to with their member of Congress about was the ADA's interim policy on opioids. Wow. That built us such credibility because no other healthcare organization had come out with a stronger policy than the American Dental Association and members of Congress said, wow, this is exactly what we need. And I, I remember it, I was having a conversation a few days before with Senator John Thune, who is now the number two ranking Republican in the Senate and, and from South Dakota. And he said, wow, the dentists have led the way. This is fantastic because we need this to get some serious discussion started on opioids and opioid abuse. And within, I think it was three or four months, Congress passed some great laws um, to help stem opioid abuse. And we're seeing those numbers come down. And I, it all began, in my opinion, with the American Dental Association and the policy that was created. So Chuck, we need to have policy. And, and that's, how, that's how we begin every discussion. The ADA has this policy, and we share that with members of Congress and try to get legislation that reflects as best as possible the, the policy of the ADA. Do you find sometimes that you need to go back to the ADA membership and say, this, you know, you want to go in this direction, but here's where it would be more palatable. In other words, is part of your influence, not just in Washington, but part of your influence is in the dent in Chicago, where the ADA is headquartered and dentists so, across the country. So you asked, you, you, you asked the question, I, I, I gave you one example. You asked the question, where's the poly com policy come from? But it really comes from anywhere. Yeah. I mean, we've had, um, we've had dentists who have Call, uh, called, written, talked to us and said, you know what, I think this is a good idea. And then that's presented to the Council on Government Affairs, for example, right. or the Council on, Council on Dental Practice. Uh, and they'll, and it begins there. And, and the dentists on those councils have that conversation. They go, this is good. We got to do something about this. And then they act. So it can begin with one person. Wow. Become one person it can begin with. Or it can, be, it can come from um, some outside influence um, that that suggests that dentistry needs to do something in this area. Um, it, you know, we're, we're, I think, bringing to the uh, House of Delegates, which will be held virtually this year in October, um, the first resolution dealing with um, veterans care. You know, we have 600 fantastically dedicated dentists who work in the VA system, um, but the way the laws are written uh, for the VA, only a small percentage of veterans, I'm a veteran myself, are eligible for VA dental care. I'm not, but it, because I don't have a service-connected uh, disability in, uh, with regard to the oral cavity, and so, um, so I don't need it. Good. Um, but a, uh, but the, the guidelines are written very narrowly, and our dentists in the VA do a terrific job in representing those dentists and taking care of those dentists who are eligible. But there's uh, you know another 90% of veterans um, who don't get that care, and many abs need it very badly, but they don't have uh, the money to pay for it. So um, we're, there's a policy coming to the House of Delegates that's going to address that. And, that's, and that right. came from a groundswell of just dentists saying, yeah, you know what, we need to do something about that. And we're working with our good friends in Dental Lifeline Network, um, who you know, I think personally. Very much. I'm on the board. Yes, you are. <laughs> and very happy to be, very proud to be. Yeah, yeah. and you should be. And and uh, so they're doing some good things. And, uh, you know, we hope to partner with organizations like that moving forward so that, you know, again, we're improving access to care for folks who who may not normally be able to get that on their own. Excellent. So yeah. magic wand kind of question. 
as an influencer, if you could change one or two things about the profession or about your influ- you know, your impact on the profession or how you know what you do, how you do what you do, what would you change uh, going forward? Like, what would you say? You know what? If I had a magic wand, this is the change I would make. In in dentistry, you're saying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I thought you were saying in lobbying, in which case uh, there's a lot of things you could that go I lobbying too, but first <laughs> in dentistry. <laughs> oh, dentistry. Well, I wouldn't have stuck around for 25 years if I didn't think the dentists were doing it right. And members of Congress stop me all the time and and say, you know, we got to protect dentistry. It's the it's the last bastion of um, uh, of a profession that really represents uh, competition um, and and small business and and ingenuity and all those great things. Um, so uh, it, there's not a whole lot I, I would change. I would say this, having been a, uh, uh, in the Navy for 21 years, uh, you've heard the term, it's like turning an aircraft carrier mm-hmm. around. It takes time. And there are probably some things that I, I think we could eliminate uh, maybe some of the, the steps that takes to get things approved so we can move a little bit quicker. But, you know, there's a benefit in, in looking at things, taking a hard look at things as well. Um, but, you know, we've done a lot of things right. And, and it's probably why we are, you know, we have a great membership um, and we have great leadership that, um, that consistently gets us through tough times. And, and obviously, you know, we're getting through COVID. We're getting through COVID better than almost any profession that I know of that's out there and it's it's because uh in part you know of of all the things that have been have come together over the years um but you know it's um it's it's hard to move a lot of people in the same direction um sometimes and and maybe if there if i had to say i'd like to see that that might be the one thing that i would see if we could improve on excellent well, let's do last question, and um, I think you're not going to be surprised when you hear what it is. So the, it seems like sometimes the caustic politics between the parties actually across the United States, and since you're a, a political um, observer and a participant in the process, can you talk a little bit about, A, sort of how you, what's right, what's wrong about the way things are done today, and then what you foresee happening where, where do you see things going yeah. today and into the future with p- the political? Well, uh, I'll share with you that when I was working in the on the Hill in the early 80s and um, on Friday afternoons, uh, there was one congressman and his staff who would actually roll a piano out of his office to the fourth floor of the Rayburn House office building, one of the three uh, house office buildings and uh, at about six o'clock because we worked usually from eight to six uh, Monday through Friday but he'd roll that out about six o'clock on Friday afternoon and um, Republican and Democrat members and staff if they were in town um, would sit around that c- piano and sing songs it was something right out of a Mickey Rooney Judy Garland movie um, and then we'd all go out and have drinks and dinner and and uh, we we did it together i mean um we had great relationships and we could differ on the policy as staff and with members um but we had great respect uh for each other and the work that we were doing and and uh and representing the folks uh in in america if i could see any change i i would hope that we would turn to back to uh, the purpose is representing the people in America in a civil and and productive way. And, you know, I'm still very hopeful that uh, I'm a believer that history is cyclical and um, we may very well come back to that. I don't know if we'll ever be singing songs in the halls of the Rayburn House office building again, but I'm very hopeful that that we'll come back to some level of civility. And very often, a crisis like this brings people together, and we get a little bit smarter. And um, so, I'm I'm very hopeful that that will happen. Um, but there's a lot of work that we have to do in America um, to to uh, get better in so many different areas. And I I, I think 
we're just going to have to do that. We're just going to have to roll up our sleeves and dentistry is going to do its part. Uh, Dentistry is going to keep pressing to take, to improve access to care, to take care of the people who, who need help taking care of their oral health um, while at the same time producing quality um, services for the patients that we see every day. Um, And, and I'm just uh, the new generation of dental students coming up Boy, they are sharp. Uh, they are sharp, and and they are a diverse population of uh, of young people who understand um, the importance of oral health. But also, I think they understand the Im- importance of being a profession that um, has a real purpose in delivering world class oral health care to their patients. And so, I'm very heartened by the the uh, the dentists that I meet every day that um, that are graduating from dental school it's a terrific bunch of people excellent well Mike thank you very much for being here today um, I want to close by saying although I'm not a dentist and you don't technically represent me as a member of the profession uh, you know the industry I want to say we are lucky to have you working for us on oh, Capitol Hill. Your team has done an amazing job of helping dentistry get through the COVID challenge. And uh, clear, it's clear from today's uh, talk that it's not an accident. You really know what you're doing and you bring well, a very you. high level of professionalism and trust to a job that's very, very important. So thank you very much. And thank you for being here today and for sharing a little bit of your wisdom with us. And um, we appreciate uh, everything you do for us. Thank you, Chuck. And, and thank you for, uh, for giving me this opportunity. And thank you for everything you do as well. Excellent. Well, good. Well, thanks very much. Thanks, Mike.